When analyzing and predicting protein structures, we rely on recurring patterns and similarities. We use our existing knowledge about the frequency of different amino acids in proteins in nature, their physical properties, and their significance in maintaining the protein structure. With sequence alignment, we can learn about the similarities and differences of known proteins, make inference for newly discovered proteins, and possibly design new proteins. In this video, we will go over the principles of sequence alignment without getting into the math and algorithms. We will also demonstrate the use of several programs freely available on the internet. Since the amino acid sequence determines the protein structure and function, we can expect that identical sequences would result in similar structure and function. And the proteins can be considered homologous. For two sequences to be considered homologs, they don't have to be identical at every position. Structure is more conserved than sequence, so even if the sequences differ in some positions, they may still be similar and therefore homologous. In fact, even sequence identity as low as 30% is considered sufficient for homology. But identity doesn't tell the whole story. Substituting a residue with another one that has similar properties such as charged or hydrophobicity would not affect the protein as much as a substitution with a residue with entirely different properties. The way we quantify similarity is by pairwise sequence alignment. We try to match pairs of residues in both sequences and give each match or mismatch a score as defined in a substitution matrix. This is the substitution matrix Blossom62, which is commonly used and is the default in many programs. Blossom62 is considered a good starting point or a middle ground substitution matrix. Other matrices may be more suitable when the sequences are known to be more distantly or more closely related. The diagonal holds the scores for matches, which is the presence of the same residue in the same position in both aligned sequences. These scores are positive as they increase the score of the alignment, meaning the sequences are more similar. Not all match scores are the same though. For example, the score of cysteine match is significantly higher than most other scores for matches. This can be attributed to the unique function of cysteine of forming disulfide bonds. No other residue can do that, so the conservation of cysteine is more significant than that of most other residues. Cells that are not on the diagonal represent mismatches and usually contain negative values, as mismatches usually decrease sequence similarity. It's important to know that some of the cells that represent mismatches do in fact contain positive values. Such cases represent substitution of a residue with a different yet similar one. For example, the match score of either valine or leucine is 4, yet the mismatch score of valine with leucine or vice versa is 3. If we look at their side chains, we can see that they are relatively similar. They are both uncharged, hydrophobic, and differ only by the position of a branched methyl group. Substituting one with the other would have very little effect on the protein, which explains the relatively high and positive score of the mismatch. Here is a website that provides another way to look at the information from the substitution matrices. In this interactive graph, each node represents an amino acid and the node size is proportional to the match score. The edges represent the mismatches between each pair of amino acids and the edge thickness is proportional to the mismatch score. The initial view shows the scores from Blossom62 and only edges with positive scores are shown. As we switch to lower Blossom matrices, down to Blossom30, we can see that more edges appear, which means that more types of mismatches are accepted. We would use such matrices if we can't find enough similar sequences and we want to increase our results. When switching to higher Blossom matrices, up to Blossom 100, edges get removed, meaning that less mismatches are accepted, and we may use such matrices when we want to make the alignment more restrictive, for example, when we want to find very closely related proteins. In addition to matches and mismatches, another thing to consider is the possibility of gaps. Gaps may result from indel mutations, which are insertion or deletion mutations. Although gaps may reduce the similarity of a sequence pair, they may allow for better positioning of similar residues in a way that would increase the overall sequence similarity. To illustrate the effect of the different mutation types, let's consider the leucine zipper motif, which is composed of two alpha helices, 
each with a periodic occurrence of leucine residue, facing another leucine residue at the opposite helix and forming hydrophobic interactions. A point mutation in which any residue is replaced with proline would prevent the formation of a hydrogen bond because the proline backbone doesn't have an NH group that could act as an hydrogen bond donor. In addition, the rigid proline ring would cause the backbone to bend in a way that would break the continuous helix. This translates to proline mismatches always carrying a negative score in Blossom 62 matrix. Point mutations in which a residue is replaced with a residue other than proline should not be as detrimental to the protein structure. A point mutation in a leucine residue could damage the interaction between the helices, but other interactions may still be able to keep the overall structure intact. An indel mutation would have a much more significant effect as it would change the facing of all subsequent residues, causing the leucine residues not to face each other anymore. This could severely damage the interactions, stabilizing the overall leucine zipper motif. Such effect explains the high penalty that is usually assigned to gaps. The same mutations, however, would have much less significant effect if they were to occur in unstructured parts of the protein, such as loops. The takeaway from this is that sequence alignment should usually be tailored to specific parts of the protein and not necessarily to the overall protein sequence. It may also be a good idea to use different substitution matrices or gap penalties for alignment of different parts of the proteins. Aligning two sequences can be useful, for example, when we know the structure of one sequence and we want to infer the structure of another protein with a similar sequence. However, using a single sequence for comparison may not be reliable since the same sequence can adopt different structures. We have also seen that not all residues carry the same weight in determining structure, function and conservation. The way to overcome this is with multiple sequence alignment. There are several methods of performing multiple sequence alignment. Most of them are based on the alignment of multiple pairs of sequences and subsequent alignment of alignments until all sequences are aligned. Different steps may use different parameters, such as different substitution matrices or gap penalties. In multiple sequence alignment, it is important not to use sequences that are too closely related, because then the results will be biased towards the similar sequences. The sequences should also not be too distant, so that the alignment score would not be too low. The result of multiple sequence alignment is similar to that of pairwise sequence alignment, but there are a few differences. In multiple sequence alignment, we are looking for conserved positions, not definite matches. A position is considered conserved if it contains similar or identical residues along a significant part of the aligned sequences. In this example, position 2 is considered conserved because it contains cysteine in all sequences. A simple way to visualize the results of a multiple sequence alignment is with a logo. Each position in the logo contains the letter of the conserved residue. The height of the letter is proportional to the conservation level of that residue. Here we see the second position in the logo containing C for cysteine, which is conserved along all the sequences. Position 5 is not conserved at all, and therefore is empty in the logo. The MPI Bioinformatics Toolkit includes several multiple sequence alignment programs through an easy-to-use web interface. From the Alignment tab, we can navigate to the different programs. We will demonstrate how to use Cluster Omega, and the use of the other programs is fairly similar. The input is at least two protein sequences. We can click Paste Example and get an example input. Then we'll click Submit. Rather than actually running the multiple sequence alignment, we can load the results of a previous run of the same input if it exists. The alignment viewer can be customized depending on our specific interests. For example, the coloring scheme can be changed. The results can be downloaded or forwarded to another program. To produce a logo, 
we can copy the results of the multiple sequence element and paste them in another website that produces the logo. Finding conserved positions in the alignment can be valuable in relating sequence to structure. Secondary structures such as alpha helices and beta sheets are usually composed of known sequence motifs. If the conserved positions match such known motifs, it is reasonable to hypothesize that the sequences do in fact fold into these secondary structures. This way secondary structures can be predicted for multiple sequence alignments. Different programs have been trained with different secondary structure motifs and can be used to predict their occurrences along a sequence given a multiple sequence alignment. In the MPI Bioinformatics Toolkit, under Secondary Structure tab, we can use the program Quick2D to predict secondary structures for a sequence. Quick2D is actually a front-end for several different programs that perform predictions for different secondary structure motifs. Quick2D aggregates the results of the different programs into a single view. Rather than creating a multiple sequence element ourselves, we can delegate this task to Quick2D, which will search for similar sequence, use them to build multiple sequence element, and forward it to the different programs that predict secondary structure. The results show the predicted secondary structure in each residue in the original query sequence. Conservation of positions can take another form. Note that position 4 and 8 are not as conserved as position 2, but there appears to be a coupling between the residues in both positions. This pattern is indicative of coevolution. A mutation in one position is balanced by another mutation in another position so that the overall protein structure doesn't change much. This hints at possible interactions between the two positions, which may be relevant to the protein structure and function. The way we show such possible contacts is with a contact map, where the axis represents the positions in the protein, and the dot is placed at any coordinate that matches the positions in a contact. In addition to point contacts, the contact map may show patterns that are indicative of secondary structures, since a secondary structure can be seen as a series of contacts between periodic residues. To sum up, let's go over a hypothetical process of protein structure prediction from a multiple sequence alignment. With a query sequence as a starting point, we first search for similar sequences. If we get too many or too few results, we can adjust our search parameters. We will then perform multiple sequence alignment with our protein sequence and the similar sequences. The sequence element will show possible contacts and conserved regions. By matching the conserved regions to known secondary structure motifs, and by looking for patterns of secondary structures in the contact map, we can assign secondary structures to the sequence. We will then try to fold the protein in a way that the residues of the contacts will be near each other. Based on the identity of the residues, we can try to infer the nature of the interaction. For example, if both residues in a contact are cysteine, it's possible it's a disulfide bond. And if both residues are charged with opposite signs, it's possible it's a salt bridge. In reality, we don't perform all these steps manually, as computers are much more capable than us in carrying out the required searches and calculations. We do need to understand the underlying principles in order to choose the correct programs and parameters, to evaluate the results and possibly process them manually further. Multiple sequence alignment is an essential part of protein structure analysis and prediction, but it's not the entirety of it. There are other aspects that need to be considered, such as energetics, dynamics, post-transitional modifications, and biological function. In the following videos, we will learn about methods and tools that, along with multiple sequence alignment, can provide us with detailed understanding of protein structure and function. I'll see you then.